Okay, take your Bible this morning and turn back to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. And I want to teach uh, this morning the second lesson uh, that I've entitled Christ, a High Priest Forever, Part 2. I know I have said this so many times as we've gone through the book of Hebrews. And if, uh, if all, every time I had talked through the book of Hebrews was recorded somewhere, and there's probably some tapes scattered around, uh, you cannot overemphasize uh, the point uh, that Paul is bringing forth, seeking to show the absolute superiority of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, matter of fact, I would rephrase that, the infinite superiority of the Lord Jesus Christ in both in his person and in his work as our substitute, our surety, our sacrifice, our redeemer, our mediator, and especially in this grand office to which the Lord assigned to him, our great high priest, how infinitely superior he was above all those Old Testament types and pictures. Now, all of us here were raised, for the most part, in false religion. And with the way that they taught on things like the Old Testament, particularly those things related to the tabernacle and the priesthood, Men and women, unregenerate men and women, are of the opinion that there was some sort of salvation or salvation. Sal what's that word that I see here when use on the internet? Salvific uh, ability in that Old Testament sacrifice, the Old Testament priesthood. That those believers back then, if there were any believers, those believers that somehow or another, they came to true faith and true repentance by believing in the blood of a physical lamb or trusting in a physical priest in Aaron or his sons after him. Nothing could be further from the truth. There was, I, I cannot overstate this. There was absolutely no salvation in any absolutely any or all of those types are shatters. Moses' hope, Aaron's hope, our hope. You believe that? Moses had the same faith we have. Not a different faith. It amazes me how I, I, I got into a I, I, I sometimes I hate posting stuff on Facebook because you get all these people come out of the woodwork with all their ideas. And, and I'm not looking. When I'm on Facebook, when I post things on Facebook, I've got one thing in mind. I'm reaching out, hopefully, in hope and in prayer that some of my family or some of my friends or some of my old classmates that I grew up with, people I've encountered in my life, my past life religiously, because I'm friends with all of them, that somehow, by God's grace, he will use some of these posts that I put out there to get them to get in touch with me. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. That's what, that's, that's what God has told us, that he has purposed and determined to save his people but one way. It's through the person and work of Christ, but it's through the preached gospel. Well, this guy was talking about, you know, he, he, was, he wrote a book, on a post that I didn't even want a book wrote, written about. <laughs> yeah, but he wrote a book. And he, he went to talking about things that, that show that they do not understand anything of the Scriptures. He talks of the Old Testament like it's a different book than the New Testament. Like the Holy Spirit didn't convey to their minds and their wills and their understanding the same truths that he conveys to his people in every generation. Answer yourself one question. Did Abraham understand imputation? Did he know anything about the imputed righteousness of the God sent? Now, he didn't know him as the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew him as who? Messiah. We know him in, in time after he's come, after he lived, after he died, after he rose again. We know him as the Lord Jesus Christ as he's presented to us in the New Testament. But it's not a different person. 
The same one. The one that was typified, the one that was prophesied of, the one who actually came in time to do everything that was required to enable God to be revealed in His covenant relationship to His people as both a just God who will by no means clear the guilty and at the same time a Savior, one who is merciful and gracious and kind and compassionate and loving and long-suffering with each of His children. There was no salvation in those things. Aaron, when he offered those sacrifices, who was he looking to? The one that it typified. Because I'm going to tell you what, if Aaron, which we know Aaron's in glory because of the word of God, but if Aaron had trusted in the lamb, that, that, the physical lamb, Aaron would have perished. He saw through those things. The, the, how, do, how do I know that? Hebrews 11. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded. Question is, who persuaded them? Did a man, did a man persuade you about Christ? I can tell you about Christ all day long. I can't persuade you. Who has to persuade you? Who has to reveal Christ to you? He does. And when he reveals himself to you, you persuade him. And I'm going to tell you what, who God persuades, no man or woman can ever unpersuade him. I don't think that's a word, but we'll use it anyhow. They, nobody can change their mind. Once you've seen him, once you've seen his righteousness, once you've seen your sinfulness, you can never go back. Never. And so he's seeking, because this is the thing, these are, <clears throat> these are Jewish believers who had been raised all their life under that Jewish system, who had been taught all these customs and rituals and all of these old Mosaic laws. They had followed the priesthood through the tabernacle and, and the Day of Atonement and all those things, and the Lord had been pleased to reveal himself to them, and, and they had at least given mental agreement to the truth and come out. And now they had seen some of their friends and some of their relatives who came out with them go back. And he's already told them he's persuaded better things of them, things that accompany salvation. Meaning this, what? He was persuaded that whoever he's writing to here, they can't go back. And they won't go back. So he begins to present argument upon argument to divorce their minds from any entertainment or any idea or thought that there was any salvation in any of that. And he also sought by various uh, presentations of Christ in comparison and contrast to all these Old Testament types to show how much better, infinitely better, Christ was. And so he goes to this type, Melchizedek, the one we started looking at a couple of Sundays ago. And he shows this, the superiority of Melchizedek over the Aaronic priesthood. Look at verses 4 down through verse 10. Now consider... How great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of his spoils. And verily they that are the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham. Who's he talking about here? Melchizedek. And blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men, and notice the way he states this. And here, in, this, in, in looking at that temple and the Aaronic priesthood that still existed at that time, which in reality, when we think about it, we're talking about some time after the Lord Jesus Christ died. Remember what happened when Christ died, right? What happened in the temple? The veil was rent in twain. But yet, what are they still doing? Huh? The glory, listen, Ichabod, when Christ cried, it is finished, Ichabod was written over that temple. What's Ichabod mean? Anybody? What does it mean? The glory has departed. 
Before God, no, we're done. Why? He had promised and purposed from the beginning this was only for a limited amount of time until the one who was promised would come. He came, did the work, claimed it, declared it's finished. What? We don't need to type anymore. Why would you go with the type if you got the fulfillment of the type? Here, men that die, the sons of Levi, they die. Every one of them die. I'm looking right now. I promise you, at some point in time, unless the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, every one of us in this building will leave this earth by means of death. Can't be avoided. And he says, every one of these Aaron, Aaronic priests, all the sons of Levi that assumed the role and office of the priesthood, which was for a limited amount of time, which had already been done away with. That's what he's seeking to prove. This, this is of no value. We were laughing about it last, I think it was, we were eating together last Sunday. Yeah, I'll never forget my brother-in-law called me one time just it was close to Easter time and they had a young preacher at that Southern Baptist Church he attends down in Belmont Louisiana and he called me up just all bent out of shape he said I need to talk with you brother-in-law and I said what what's up and he said he said our preacher down here is wanting to sacrifice a lamb and I said what do you mean he said he wanting to on Easter Sunday he's wanting to sacrifice a lamb on Easter Sunday and I said for what reason there's no need to offer a lamb. Christ is a lamb of God, right? Why go back? Why do anything that has any reflection on all that? Because listen, there's no life, there's no salvation, there's no deliverance in any of those things. But he said, here men that die receive tithes. But there, talking about at this particular time, he, talking about Melchizedek, receiveth them of whom it is witness that he liveth. And as I may say so, Levi also who received tithes paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. That's a, that's a lengthy passage of Scripture, but there's a lot here. There's a lot here. And see what the apostle's showing here is he's showing the superiority of Melchizedek over all those men that the Jews held in such high esteem. Who did the Jews hold in high esteem? Particularly, who did the scribes and Pharisees hold in such high esteem? Who? Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, Solomon, Aaron, even Abraham. Remember, the, remember what the Jews, Jews, the Pharisees said? In John chapter 8, we be Abraham's sons and are not born of fornication. Like that means anything. Huh? There's life in being a Jew. Listen to me. All those individuals I just listed out to you. And they are, listen, David. This is, this is King David, the one they held. This, we, they were looking for a king like David. And that what they, they were looking for an earthly kingdom with an earthly ruler, a monarch, to deliver Israel out from underneath Roman rule and put them back on the path to superiority over all nations. King David said this, Lead, when, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. He wasn't looking for somebody. He was an earthly monarch. What's he looking for? A spiritual king whose kingdom is above, Jerusalem, which is above all. All these individuals that these Jews thought so highly of, they were in the loins of Abraham. Every one of them. And what he's showing here is this. If they were in the loins of Abraham, and if Melchizedek was above all these, and he was, including Abraham, if Melchizedek was above Abraham in that Abraham paid tithes to who? 
Melchizedek, he, isn't that what he said? He says that, uh, the, the, how, how did he state that? He said, the, the less is blessed of the better. So if Melchizedek received tithes, in other words, there was a debt to be paid to Melchizedek. He paid tithes to Melchizedek. If Melchizedek is a type, a picture, or a foreshadowment of the Lord Jesus Christ, how much infinitely superior, superior is the Lord Jesus Christ over Abraham? How much more excellent is the substance over the, over the type? Think about the question the Pharisees asked Christ. In John 8, 53, they looked at our Lord and said, Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? Hold on just a second. for that. They said, Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? I didn't turn it off. I let it keep running. Okay. One thing they admit, what's happened? Abraham, who they thought was great, where's he at? In the ground. The prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Joel, Jonah, major and minor, where are they all at now? According to them, they're, they're dead. And their thought process is this. If they're dead and in the ground, are you greater than he, them? You great. If Abraham couldn't overcome it, are you a certain that you're greater and more powerful. Matt told me we had a bunch of them last week. Woo! Hey, dude. I gotta have a gotta have a wasp kill it. <laughs> he won't die. All kind of excitement this morning. <laughs> we got to figure out where them wasps are coming from out of that back room back here and take care of them. <laughs> okay. Now, the, the question is this. And it shows the necessity of the Hebrews making these arguments. Making these, Paul making these arguments to these Hebrew believers. Is Christ greater than Abraham? Because that's, that's what he's about to prove. Is Christ greater than Abraham? And the answer is infinite. Notice what he says in verse 8. And here men that die receive tithes. But there he receiveth them of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. Here's his argument. <clears throat> if you recognize the, the dignity of a temporal priesthood, which they did, which was established 
only for a limited period of time. And you got to keep that in mind. There was, God never intended for this, this Levitical priesthood to go in on indefinitely. How much more honor belongs to an eternal priesthood? One, one set up for a limited time, one set up for eternal time, a priesthood that never changes, that priesthood typified by Melchizedek and secured and assigned to the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son incarnate. Because he says this, this, this priest witnessed that he does what? He liveth. He liveth. Now, I know people get out in the weeds on this thing of Melchizedek, try to prove like he's some kind of mysteri mysterious, mystical character. When it talks about he was without beginning, I said this two weeks ago, I think, when it said he was without beginning, without ending, having no history of his mother and his father, it talks about there's no genealogy on his priesthood. You couldn't trace him back. You know, that was essential. And I, I think that's the problem that they've got today. For them to have reestablish the Levitical priesthood today, if they ever did tear down that, that mosque of the dome over there that it, all these premillennialists keep talking about, that that's going to be the next thing, that they're going to tear down the dome of the mosque and they're going to build back Solomon's temple over there. I want to see them suckers find a son of Levi of the house of Aaron because it can't be anybody but the, nobody but the son of Aaron could occupy that office. They're all dead. They're gone. You can't reestablish what's been done away. But Melchizedek, there's no history on him. We don't have any recording of where he died. So when it says here, uh, you know, what he's telling us here is that uh, there, there's no time period fixed by God. No bounds or limitations of time on this priesthood as there was on Abram's. He lives. And then what our Lord Jesus Christ, it says to him, he ever liveth to do what? To make intercession for us. Abram could make intercession until he took his last breath. And then his intercession come to a close. Christ never ends. See, they're, 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 you, you think about it like this. Melchizedek said to live, but not personally, but what lives? His office lives. A priest forever. Christ is a priest forever after the order, after the type, after the foreshadowment of who? Melchizedek. And again, his birth, Melchizedek's birth, his, his death, his genealogy are not recorded, that, and they're not recorded for this reason. He can be a perfect, a perfect type, a perfect representation of Christ's priesthood in office. You say, well, I, I, don't, I don't go along with that. Well, let me ask you, here's a, it, the Scriptures do that a lot. You know, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 through 28, we'll read it next Sunday when we have the Lord's table. Our Lord Jesus Christ said that the elements of the Lord's table, the wine, the unleavened bread, and the wine, he says, they are my body and my blood. Now, the Catholics think that they actually become his body and his blood. They don't become his body. There's, no, it, it, there's an unleavened wafer that we'll take, and when we take the unleavened wafer, it's still going to be an unleavened wafer. And we'll take a cup of wine next Sunday. And when we take that cup of wine, what's it still going to be? It's going to be a cup of wine. It's not turning into the literal blood and body of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what that says when he says that they are my body and are they are my, my, my uh, blood, what's he saying? They're his representatively. They represent him. The, blood, the, the bread represents what? His broken body. And the wine represents his shed blood. Look at verse 9 and 10. It says, And as I may say so, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, what did he do? He paid tithes. Paid them where? In, Mo, in Abraham. For he was in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. 
You know what we see here? We see the principles of representation and what else? Imputation. Abraham, what did he do? He represented his prosperity. All, all of his people were where? In him. And whatever he did, what's, what, what, according to what this says, what's happened? It's all imputed to his posterity. Because that's what he says. Levi paid tithes where? Levi was a long time after Abraham. He didn't pay tithes personally. But he sure, just as sure as Abraham paid tithes, he paid them how? By imputation. By representation. But notice the next thing he says. Look at the establishment of perfection. This is where I wanted to get this morning. I, I, this, to me, this is one of my favorite parts of this particular chapter. Verse 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Abraham? I was sitting there this morning looking back over my notes and something jumped out at me. And I, that, that word perfection, word perfection, words are everything. You know, I, I, I've told you this for years, all the years I've been your pastor. Get you, I mean, I know, what, I, I don't expect any of us to be Greek and Hebrew scholars. I'm not a Greek scholar. I ain't had one ounce of education beyond when me and Kenny graduated high school in 1976. I'm a country boy with country ways. But I tell you, what, I can use the tools God's provided me. Get you a good concordance. Get you some, you know, get you some good study tools. And don't just always follow it and swallow it and assume that it means something just because King James wrote it down. Because there's something that we miss in this word perfection. You know what this, this word is translated perfection here? You know, it's the same word the Lord Jesus Christ spoke when he was on the cross. Three English words. It is finished. One Greek word, teleos. And it's the same word that the Apostle Paul used over in Romans chapter 10, verse 4. What did he say? For Christ, the end. That's the same word. Translated perfection here. The end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now this word... Translated perfection, you know what it means? It means exactly what it says. It means a completing. It means a perfecting. It means a fulfillment. It means an accomplishment. It is finished. What was accomplished? Righteousness was established. Salvation was secured. He didn't put people in a savable position. Christ saved his people from their sins. It was guaranteed. Perfection, when you think about it, it's the establishment of that righteousness which brings justification and eternal life. Hold your place there. Turn over to Romans chapter 1, a very familiar passage of Scripture, one that you ought to have memorized. If you don't have, you ought to have, you ought, ought to have Romans 1, 16 memorized. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. What's he not ashamed of? The gospel of Christ. Why are you not ashamed of it, Paul? For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's the dynamite. That's what that word power means. For therein, therein where? The gospel. In the gospel, what's revealed? Let me ask you this. If you go to church here or anywhere else, or you listen to a message here or anywhere else today, how can you determine whether it's a gospel message? What's the determining factor? Bart, the righteousness of God has to be preached out. If some man stands up in a pulpit today and he does not declare Christ's righteousness as the sinner's only ground, hope, and cause for salvation, 
He has not preached the gospel. Period. I don't care what he talks about. He can talk about election till he's blue in the face. He can talk about predestination till he's blue in the face. He can talk about a thousand other doctrines that are true and correct and accurate and our comfort and our security and our peace. But if you preach predestination or election or anything apart from Christ's accomplished work of redemption, you've not preached the gospel. You've taught a dissertation, a lesson that does not point me into Christ. The Jews believed in election, did they not? They didn't believe election in Christ, that we were chosen in him. But he goes on, he says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith, this written word, to faith. What's that? The faith of God's elect. The faith that comes in regeneration and conversion. It's revealed from this book to faith as it's written. Not those that believe will be justified, but it says what? The justified, the just, that's what that word just means, justified, the righteous. How do they live? They live by faith. Faith in what? That righteousness of God that's preached out. Every moment of their whole life. And see, that's the heart of Christ's priestly office and his priestly work. It's the, it's the foundation. What Christ accomplished is the foundation of his intercession even now. If he didn't accomplish what he said he was sent to accomplish, he didn't actually save his people from their sins, he didn't actually secure my salvation, he has no ground upon which to intercede for me. Everything that he does rested upon his accomplishment. Is God-man mediator. And this perfection that he's talking about, it ensures our acceptance with God. The thing you've got to keep in mind is this. God had never intended perfection to come by the Levitical system, the Levitical priesthood. In fact, you know what he says? He said that's absolutely impossible. Listen to you. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away Wherefore, we, we read this every time we take the Lord's table. And we, we re, sometimes you, you read these words, you don't think about them. Think about what he says here. It's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to put away sin. Wherefore, since that's impossible, when he comes into the world, who's he here? Christ, one that Melchizedek typified. When he comes into the world, he saith what? Sacrifice and offerings Thou wouldest not. In other words, that wasn't what God required. But a body has thou prepared me. In burnt offering and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come, and the volume of the book is written to me to do thy will, O God, above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offering and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure therein which were offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he might establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all is in italic so it wasn't in the original one of the things I find so extremely interesting about this particular passage is that that word translated pleasure twice in this passage you know it's applied consistently to but one person the Lord Jesus Christ that word pleasure you say well where's that applied to the Lord Jesus Christ remember when he was baptized in Matthew 3, 17, it says, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom, here's the word, I am well pleased. God can take no pleasure. He cannot be satisfied. He cannot have perfection. He cannot have fulfillment. 
He cannot have accomplishment in sacrifices and offerings. Remember what he said to the scribes and Pharisees? He says, I will not have sacrifices and offerings. But what? Mercy. Mercy. What's mercy? God not giving me what I deserve. It don't come by sacrifices and offerings. And see, here's the thing. If, if perfection could come by the Levitical priesthood, if there was any chance of anybody being saved under any of that, there would have been no need for Christ. How do we know that? Paul said if righteousness come by the law, there could have been a law given that could have given righteousness. Righteousness would have been by the law. He said, if righteousness come by the law, what, what's the implications of that? Christ died in vain. There'd be no need. See, God had promised perfection only one place, through the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul is arguing that that old covenant priesthood had been able to produce a perfect state. If it had been able to produce a perfect state, and accomplish everything necessary for a sinner's eternal salvation, there'd have been no reason for another priesthood of a wholly different order to come as the, their own scriptures, their own scriptures had predicted this. See, the introduction of Christ's priesthood and the fulfillment of perfection by him means the absolute abolishment of that old Levitical priesthood. And therefore, that whole economy. And that should have impressed on these people that he's writing to the danger of going back to that, trying to go back to that old system, trying to seek life, trying to give credit for salvation and anything back over in that old what? You know, I, Bill and I have talked about it, and a lot of us have talked about it, where the water meets the road is this. Is there salvation in any other person than in Christ's accomplished work? Is there salvation under anything else that men and women call the gospel other than that gospel that preaches out Christ and his righteousness alone is a sinner's only ground, hope, and cause of salvation? Right there is where men and women are separated. I get, as long as you think a person can be saved before the gospel or without the gospel, preached, that's what the argument I got into that guy about. He said, I disagree with you. I think people can be saved by reading. The scriptures don't support that. You say, oh, yeah, they do. No, they don't. I, I told him, I said, we're not called to be Gideons. We're, we're told by our Lord, preach the gospel. Right? Peter told us to do what? Preach the word. Be, Paul told Timothy, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. You say, well, then you're denying that God can save sinners any way he wants to. No, God's absolutely sovereign. If God wanted to, it was his purpose to save sinners any way he wanted to, he could absolutely do that. But when he's told us in his word how he saves his people, how does he save his people? Do you know? 1 Corinthians chapter 1 tells you, God, after that, the world by wisdom knew not God. God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Every incident you see in the scriptures where God calls one of his people out, you know what he always sends somebody to do? To preach the gospel to them. Always. That eunuch that was out in the wilderness, where was he coming back from? Jerusalem, right? What was he doing while he was riding along in this chariot? He was reading the scriptures. What scriptures? Isaiah 53. Well, if the Holy Spirit can open the scripture to somebody to save them, why didn't he just open Isaiah 53 and open his eyes to see it? Yet God had taken one of his deacons, Philip, told him to leave Jerusalem where a revival was at and go out into the desert. And he goes out in the desert. Go read the narrative in, in Acts chapter 8. The Holy Spirit told him. 
The Holy it records it that way. The Holy Spirit told Philip, join yourself to that chariot. And here he goes. He runs alongside of him and he asks the guy, do you understand what you read? He's reading it. I guarantee he, 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 people say, well, he wasn't sincere enough. It ain't got nothing to do with sincerity. He was reading because he, he, he was reading it seriously. I guarantee he took it, it to him as well. It's amazing that that dude had a portion of the word of God. A, a Ethiopian eunuch under Candace. He's reading the book, reading, the, reading that papyrus or whatever it is, that scroll. He's reading it. Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, here's his response. How can I accept some man teach me? And that word teach means guide me. And then he asked this question. The, the eunuch asked Philip, is he writing of himself or is he writing of another? And he climbed up into that chair. That guy encouraged, that eunuch encouraged him to come up. And he said he picked up wherever he was reading at in Isaiah 53. And it says, states it this way. He didn't hand the book back to him and say, keep reading. I'm going to pray for the Spirit to open your mind to it. He took and said, at the same place, he preached unto him Jesus. And that word preach, you know what it means? It's a herald. It means one who is a bringer of good news. Now what Christ said, he said, remember when he read in Luke chapter 4? He said that the, the spirit of the Lord, how, how did he say? Go over and we'll quit right there this morning. Look over at Luke chapter 4. You may be going down as it was his custom was in Nazareth to read the script, to, to go to the tabernacle. And he was sitting there and they brought him the book. He opened the book to Isaiah. And he began to read, and he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Who is doing the preaching? Christ is. And if Christ said it was his duty to preach the word, what about us? I, I told that guy, I said, you know, the best thing we can do, according to what you're saying, is be like the Gideons. If, if the Lord just miraculously opens the word of God over where Afghanistan fell this week, let's take a bunch of C-135s, load them with King James Bible versions of the Bible, translate it into Aramaic or whatever, and dump them out. And hope that the Lord would be pleased to open their minds to it. It doesn't say faith comes by reading. How does it come? It comes by hearing. That guy said, well, I just don't feel comfortable with a, a human being being involved in Somebody having uh, been come to salvation. I, my thoughts is, I ain't, I ain't ever saved anybody, and I ain't involved in your salvation. My responsibility is to do what? Preach the gospel with the means that God's given me. And if it's His will, you know what He'll do? He'll open your mind and understanding to it, and He'll teach you of Himself. But somehow shall they call on Him of whom they have not? Heard, and that word heard there means an audible voice. And how shall they hear except one preach? What? Herald it, declare it, bring an announcement of good news. And how shall they preach except what? God sends them like he sent Philip. How beautiful, here it is, how beautiful are the feet of them that bring glad tidings of good things. So then. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes how? By the Word of God. And that, that, that Word of God there, it's not so much this written Word. You know what it is? It's logos. What's that? Christ said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
Hearing comes who has to give the hearing, the word of life, even our Lord Jesus Christ by his Holy Spirit. And we'll stop right there, and we'll come back, and we'll pick up verse 12 next week. You're dismissed the worship hour.